All right, and then Chris, if you want to pull up the presentation as well, um, we can just have it on the intro slide while folks are, are hopping in here. And I think I'll just give it one minute. Uh, welcome everybody. We're gonna give it just one minute while people are joining and then uh, we'll get started. All righty. Well, let's let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I know we have everybody. Welcome, welcome. Uh, we have a lot of great content today, so I want to uh, use our time wisely here. Uh, but welcome. Um, you are in the right spot if you are looking for the training on evictions in Arizona. Um, so uh, today we are very blessed to have uh, two presenters with us. We have uh, Pam Bridge, the director of litigation and advocacy. Uh, from Community Legal Services, and then Chris Groninger, the Chief Strategy Officer from the Arizona Bar Foundation. Um, they're going to be presenting today on, on eviction. You saw some bullet point uh, list on my email that kind of goes over some of the core aspects, but I'm really excited for this content. Um, and this will be recorded, uh, and there are uh, documents that will, of course, go along with this. Uh, MAG will be sending out and posting the documents, the presentation, and the recording um, after this uh, training is completed. So if you or your colleagues miss the training but are interested in um, maintaining or getting the information, or if you were here and you want to just look back on it, you'll be able to gather that. Uh, in addition, we will be taking questions throughout. You do not need to wait till the end. There is a Q&A function that you see um, on the bottom, uh, please type your questions and we will get to them as we progress through the presentation as much as possible. All right, so again, thank you everybody for joining and a big shout out to Pam and Chris for taking the time to chat with our community on, on such an important topic. So with that, I'll uh, pass it over to Chris. Thanks, TJ, and thank you everybody for being here today. Um, good morning, I'm Chris Granger. I'm with the Arizona Bar Foundation. Um, and joining me is Pam Bridge. Our contact information is there for you. So if you have questions or want to get in touch afterwards, you can email us. Uh, we are gonna go through things a little bit quickly today, just to make sure that we are covering all the important things in a, in a brief amount of time. So I'm gonna go ahead and just kick us off uh, with talking about eviction in Arizona. It can be, I think we all kind of know um, that eviction has, had kind of dropped off during the pandemic or during the start of the pandemic when there were moratoriums in place that helped keep eviction numbers low, but it didn't entirely stop in Arizona. So you can see this graph here. We'll show you that in 2019, beginning of 2020, we had a move that, that was pretty typical for the number of eviction filings throughout Arizona. And then you see a significant drop. What we wanna pay attention to right now is, uh, is where we're coming back up to normal levels of eviction filings. And you can see that at the end with September and October. Um, in Arizona, overall, Maricopa County accounts for a very, very, very large percentage of eviction filings throughout the state, followed by Pima County, and then the other counties make up just a small fraction of the filings, but the bulk is definitely in Maricopa County. Most evictions in Arizona are for non-payment of rent, um, but there may be other legal issues that impact payment, like such as wage dispute, child support, um, a priority of other basic needs like medical needs, um, overpaying rent, that should have some kind of legal assistance involved there. Um, most property owners are represented by attorneys. I think it's about 90%. Um, and most tenants represent themselves in these actions. Other factors and reasons for, for eviction might include non-compliance or violations of the lease, the health and safety, um, or property owner changes. And, and these may be legal issues that a lawyer should address as well. Before we get too far into it, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about the difference between legal information and legal advice. 
if you're in the helping role of, of helping someone who's navigating a housing crisis, it can be really, really important to know the difference between legal information and legal advice. So legal information is factual information. It's generic and it applies to all people, all renters, all tenants, um, or, or to a specific class of people in a particular situation. Anytime that generic information is interpreted or that law is interpreted and applied to a specific situation, that becomes legal advice. So just wanna make sure to, to keep in mind and, and be mindful of the difference between legal information and what you can offer and legal advice. I won't spend a lot of time on this here, except to say that it does matter. Um, you cannot give legal advice unless you're a licensed attorney. And that's an important thing to know. It can be very confusing for uh, tenants or for those that are experiencing a crisis to, to understand the difference between information that's being given and advice on how to handle the situation. So uh, one real easy way to tell if someone is asking for legal advice is if is how they phrase their question. So should I or shouldn't I, can I do this or can't I do this? Is this true or not true? Is it best for me to do this? Um, and can the landlord do that? Those are often questions that indicate a response would probably be legal advice. But you can get around that and talk about legal information by saying that the rule or the law says, or generally tenants in this situation might you know, have this remedy available. Um, and if you have legal questions that are specific to us that you get that are asking for legal advice, it's really important to refer them on to free or low cost legal help. So making sure that you get them to the place where the advice is necessary and can be given. So important ways to help know about the process, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. Know about what rules and laws apply, also gonna cover that. Know where to get legal help and know what other resources and help exist and where to find it. So we're gonna cover all of those, those the ways to help today. So I'm gonna turn this over to Pam to cover the exciting rules and laws that we're gonna be talking about. Great, thanks, Chris. Okay, so when we talk about evictions, we talk about the rules of how the eviction process and then also the laws, like what you can be evicted for. So Arizona court rules are the rules adopted by the Supreme Court governing legal proceedings and courts across the state. Our Arizona revised statute are laws passed by the legislature and signed by the governor that apply to all citizens and cover a variety of topics. Um, so our rules for the evictions are set forth in the rules of procedure for eviction actions. We call that RPF. Uh, they are statewide rules of the Supreme Court that the landlord, the tenant, the judge must follow whenever a residential tenant is facing an eviction. Next slide. So these rules cover the, as I said, the entire process from the notice, the complaint and summons, the hearings, the judgments, and the writ of restitution. Next slide. Um, there are also um, rules for civil procedure. Our rules for evictions are separate than the normal rules for civil procedure. But normally, if you're suing someone um, in Arizona, you follow the Arizona rules of civil procedure. In such cases, as if you're uh, suing for your um, your security deposit, you would follow that. Just the evictions have their separate rules. Next slide. And we look at the law. Um, and there's three main laws that you need to know when we're talking about evictions. We first have our Arizona Residential uh, Landlord Tenant Act that includes apartments, townhomes, condominiums, um, mobile homes, if it's not owned by the, by the tenant. If the person is renting the mobile home, then our we call it art law, then art law applies. We also have a separate Arizona mobile home parks residential landlord tenant. That is when the tenant, we call them the tenant, but they are actually homeowners. They own their home, but then they rent that space around their home from a park owner. And we also have the Arizona Recreational Vehicle Long-Term Rental Space Act. That is for our RVs um, that are on lots or spaces. Next slide. Um, during COVID, we had additional orders and laws that we had to follow. We had executive orders 
um, from the national government and from Arizona. We had uh, administrative orders that were coming down from our Supreme Court. Then we had federal laws, Arizona laws, and lots of agency orders. Next slide. Um, our, Amer our Arizona Supreme Court during COVID issued several um, orders, and that was really how to interpret some of the federal laws and things that were going on and making sure that we were using consistent practices throughout the state. Um, they had several um, with the last one, 2021-129, um, that talk about evictions. Oh, actually, the last one is 2021-53, 2021-129. Um, so those are the ones to look at. Uh, they, they state that what went into effect when the CDC order ended, which it did end, or, which it did end. Um, so it allows eviction cases that will be in different stages. Um, the, the, at, right when it ended, the court could schedule a hearing on whether the judgment has already been entered. Uh, the landlord could file a motion for a hearing to amend the complaint, maybe if there was new rent owed, um, or in many cases there was already a judgment and the landlord could go back in and apply for the writ. Next slide. Evictions happen in court. An eviction hearing, um, the purpose is to determine if the landlord has a legal right to have the tenant evicted because the tenant violated the rental agreement. Um, you cannot go to court without evicting, without, you cannot evict someone without going to court. Eviction cases are called summary processes. Um, we have uh, one of the quickest processes in the entire country. By design, evictions are supposed to be processed in a summary manner or quick fashion. Um, in Arizona, in fact, the process from the initial notice to the tenant to the writ of restitution, which locks the tenant out, can be as short as three weeks, depending on the reason for the eviction. Next slide. So there are eviction timeline factors. You know, what the reason for the eviction complaint depends on how long um, the process takes. Uh, there's the reasons could be non payment of rent, which, as Chris said, is the most frequent way, but not it. 76% of all evictions are non payment of rent, could be a violation of the lease, um, or it could be a material and irreparable breach. Next slide. Um, also, it depends on the type of rental property that we're talking about. I told you about those three different laws. Um, they all go through the eviction court, but they allow for different timelines between the residential mobile home and the RV space. So just as an overview, the first thing that has to happen is the landlord provides a notice to the tenant about the lease or rental violation not being followed. That notice has to be in writing. The tenant then has an opportunity to correct the problem, unless it is an immediate and irrepar irreparable violation of the lease, which means something so serious that the tenant needs to leave immediately and doesn't have a right to cure, such as um, committing a crime on the property or uh, to a, another person or uh, severe property damage. However, if the tenant, so for everything else besides immediate irreparable, the tenant has a right to cure. If it's not corrected, then within the timeline that the landlord gave the tenant, the landlord has to file a complaint with the court to evict the tenant. You can't just kick the tenant out. There has to be a complaint filed. And the tenant is issued a summons by the court uh, for a hearing about the complaint. Next slide. Next thing that the landlord and tenant have a hearing with the judge about the complaint. The judge decides whether the landlord has a legal right to evict the tenant and any money owed. That is the only issue um, besides counterclaims that can be heard at the eviction hearing. The judge issues a judgment. The judgment will state whether the tenant must leave the property or that they can stay. If the, if the landlord wins and the judge determines the tenant is evicted, the landlord can then re request a writ of restitution. And that's what um, promote, that's what allows the sheriff or constable to remove the tenant from the property and change the locks. Um, we are not gonna get into all of these, uh, all of this, but um, this will be given to you. And it's just a shortcut to let you know about the whole process for notice um, to the tenant for non-payment of rent. Uh, next slide. Um, 
And there's also, it also breaks down the process for those lease violations. Um, it is a little bit different um, than non-payment of rent, uh, but the, these charts will let you know each step-by-step -step, um, that, that needs to happen. And then the immediate, like I told you, where the tenant doesn't have a, a right to cure, but uh, the, the landlord can get the tenant out immediately and file the complaint immediately. Next slide. So let's talk about issue spotting, problems with the notice, the summons, and the complaint. These are things when someone says, uh, I, you know, there's no defense to non-payment of rent. Well, there are things that you could be looking at to see if they are done correctly. So for instance, in a non-payment of rent case, they have to say how much the tenant owes. It has to be the right amount and how long they have before the landlord files the eviction complaint. Um, it must state the correct amount of days. So the correct amount of days that the tenant has, normally it's a five day in a normal residential landlord tenant act case, but it could be different um, depending on whether it's mobile home or RV. And it can only include late fees if it's stated in the lease. A lot of times landlords wanna get late fees, um, but they never wrote it in the lease, so they don't have a right to it. Um, the material breach, it has to describe exactly what the tenant did wrong in wrong. So, and then how long the tenant has to fix the problem before the landlord files for an eviction. It can't just say a uh, tenant violated the, the lease. It has to say exactly what they did. Um, maybe they have a guest that stayed over the 14 days that they're allowed to stay, or maybe they have a barking dog over the loud over during quiet hours, but it has to state exactly what they had, what they did wrong. So the tenant knows how to cure it. And then, and then the immediate and it has to describe uh, the material uh, and irreparable breach exactly. It doesn't have to tell the tenant they have a right to cure it, but it has to tell the tenant that the landlord files to file an eviction complaint against the tenant immediately and tell them exactly what they did wrong. Um, so these notices have to be delivered. This notice cannot be a text. It has to be in writing. Um, it has to be in person either to the tenant or to another adult who lives with the tenant. No dropping off the notice to the child at the house. And it has to be by registered or, or, or it can be by registered or certified mail. Next. So options for tenants. So the tenants get this notice, right? And let's just say they've got the non-payment of notice, the non-payment. They've told that they have not paid rent on time and they, they got the proper notice. One thing they can do is just pay the amount immediately they can say okay oh i owe 700 dollars. i'm gonna pay that within the five days or whatever time i had to pay it if they pay that amount uh the the landlord cannot continue um and file the complaint and it just acts like the notice had never happened the other thing they could do when it says pay or quit that means that they could say okay i'm not going to pay it at the end of uh during the time period they want to give me instead I'm gonna turn in the keys and leave because the notice tells them that their tenancy is ending in five days unless they pay it or whatever time the law says. So one thing they could do is turn in the keys, get their stuff out and leave the property. Um, they could also negotiate a payment arrangement with the property owner. We always tell tenants, if you do that, make sure that payment arrangement um, is in writing and that the landlord's not gonna proceed with the eviction against the tenant. And here's a big defense for tenants. They can make a partial payment that the landlord accepts. So if the landlord accepts any amount of rent um, from the tenant or from anybody that's not a government agency, the landlord cannot proceed against the tenant um, for non-payment of rent. That is a big defense that tenants have um, because sometimes the landlords are happy, especially during COVID to get anything rather than nothing. Um, but if they don't accept it, as in turn it back to the tenant, say, I'm not accepting this, I'm not accepting this check, they don't get that defense. But if they accept any amount, uh, the landlord cannot evict them for non-payment of rent. Um, a tenant can also bring defenses and counterclaims if it's a non-payment of rent. So if maybe they didn't have air conditioning and they gave proper notice, uh, you can't just counterclaim without uh, following the statutes uh, for counterclaims, meaning you had... If, if you're gonna counterclaim for habitability issues, let's say in a non-payment of rent case, like air conditioning or not having water or essential, something essential, then you had to have given the landlord notice and followed the proper statute for how to bring that counterclaim. 
So let's just say it was a material breach, meaning they wrote, they violated something in the lease, like the barking dog situation um, that barks even you know during quiet hours. So the one thing they can do is just fix the problem. With normally in a material breach, you get 10 days to fix the problem if it's not a health and safety violation. Um, and so long as they stop doing that. So if they have the the, the guest who stayed over, if the guest leaves, they fixed it. If they can get their dog to not bark during that time, whatever it is on that notice, they can fix it during that time. That is, they are good. Landlord cannot um, uh, proceed with an eviction against them. They could also do, like I said before, at the end of the time period, uh, you know, during that time period, they could say, okay, I can't actually fix this or I'm not gonna you know, kick grandma out because of the unwanted guest or whatever. I'm gonna turn the keys in and I'm gonna leave. Uh, they can do that also. Um, and then they can bring defenses to court. They can't bring counterclaims, but they can bring defenses such as, uh, you know, maybe their guest did something bad they didn't know about, or maybe they didn't do it. Um, and then an immediate, immediate, there's really nothing a tenant can do besides show up at court to try to fight that. There is no right to cure. Uh, there's nothing, there's really no uh, defenses or things that tenants can bring besides did they do it or didn't they do it. Um, always make sure you're communicating with the landlord in writing and keep copies of all communication. When the tenant is communicating with the landlord right now, you can text. The only time that can't be in a text is one of those notices of termination from the landlord to the tenant. But you know, when the, when the, if a tenant is asking for things to be fixed, all of that right now can be by text or email. Next, next slide. So when the landlord has the tenant serve the summons, each of the following has to be included um, with that summons. So that, that summons, when the tenant gets it, all of these things have to be included with the summons. Um, there has to be a copy of the, of the complaint, what the landlord filed. There's got to be a copy of the notice. Um, that the landlord gave or posted to the tenant. That's their notice of termination that has to be attached to that summons. There has to be a copy of the residential eviction information sheet or another document containing that same information. Our courts have stated that these are the things that let you know, the tenant know about their rights. That sheet has to be included. Um, a copy of any of the items or rental agreement or a lease addendum that are directly related to the claims against the tenant. So if the landlord is claiming that the tenant had a barking dog over quiet hours, then it would need to say, it would need to, they, that summons would have to include where in the lease it says that you can't have loud noises after a certain time. It has to have where in the lease or what exactly the tenant violated. If they can't have a guest after 14 days, then that needs to include a copy um, of that part of the lease that says you can't have a guest stay more than 14 days. Um, and then for non-payment of rent, and this is really important, this is the first thing that we always look for, they have to include a copy um, of the tenant's charges and payments for the past six months. That's really important because you wanna check to see is the amount that they say the tenant owes the right amount. A lot of times tenants say, hey, no, I like last month I did pay rent and they're not showing that in that. So that ledger, and it doesn't have to be an official letter, just something in writing really has to explain why they believe the tenant owes them rent. And it has to show the last six months. Next slide. The complaint has to state exactly why the landlord wants to have the tenant evicted, the specific reasons why the, it just can't say the tenant violated the lease. It has to be how they violated the lease. What exactly did they do? It has to state the tenant, the date the tenant was served or given the required notice, how the tenant was served or given the notice, because tenants can look there and go, hey, that's, I never got the notice. And that's not how I was given it. And if the tenant's rent is subsidized, a statement indicating that the tenant's rent is subsidized. So if uh, section eight is one of the ways that tenant's rent could be subsidized. Um, so if it's in section eight, it has to stay a statement stating that the tenant's rent is subsidized. Next slide. If the landlord is asking for money, the complaint must also state how often the tenant was supposed to pay rent the date when the rent was due, how much rent was due on each day, how late fees were calculated according to the lease or rental agreement. Remember those late fees can't be on there unless they're in the lease. The total amount of the tenant, um, total amount owed by the tenant 
on the date the landlord filed the eviction complaint. And again, a special rule for those tenants whose rent is subsidized, it has to have a breakdown, um, if the rent is subsidized, a breakdown of the total amount of the rent each month, the tenant's portion of the rent and how much the tenant owes. So if they're, let's say in section eight, which again is just only one type of subsidized housing, but if they're on section eight and the tenant pays $300 a month, the tenant, the landlord can't be asking $4,000 if they got $700 from Section 8. It has to state that the tenant owes that their, three, their portion, their $300. Next slide. Um, and so I will just say, too, that these are um, three of our, I'm part of Community Legal Services. We are a nonprofit law firm. We have attorneys and paralegals um, that can assist tenants for free. Um, we also have special programs, you know, that uh, can in Maricopa County that we can represent tenants um, regardless of their income. Um, any tenant facing an eviction for non-payment of rent and in the city of Phoenix, if they're 200% of under the poverty line, we can represent them for any type of eviction. Uh, we, again, we are free. We have attorneys and paralegals on staff that do this work every single day. Um, it, our sister organizations, DNA and Southern Arizona Legal Aid also have um, staff that are able to assist um, tenants for free. Um, and so this is what we have lots of attorneys that this is what they do. Uh, please reach out. You can always email me with questions or um, send people if someone's having a hard time getting through to us for some reason, you can email me and we'll get a hold of them. All right. Great. Do we want to pause for a minute and see if we have any questions? Um, and we don't have any questions listed in the Q&A. Um, I will point, I know we have more people on now than we did at the very beginning. Um, you should all see the Q&A function at the bottom. Um, please feel free to ask any questions that you have, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can uh, during the call. And if not, we'll be able to follow up via email. Uh, but Chris, back to you, because there's no questions at this time. Great. So thank you, Pam, for covering all the information about rules and laws and about the process itself. And it can be really overwhelming to know, especially for tenants, but even for those that are helping to know exactly how to help or what's the best way to help in that situation. So I'm glad that Pam talked about legal aid because legal aid is a key part of eviction um, for tenants to make sure that they have representation and their rights are protected. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how to help um, tenants in other ways. So one of the most important ways that you can help is helping them gather or organize important documents. That can be a copy of the lease or the rental agreement. Like Pam mentioned, it's really important to be able to go back and see um, what violations may have occurred or if late fees are supposed to be included in the lease. That's where you're going to find out. Um, keeping copies of, of all the communication or notice back and forth or organizing those together a copy of the notice or summons, keeping that um, all of those key pieces of, of information together and organized in a way that's easy to understand. And then copies of any rental assistance applications or related documents. And we've been doing this for a while now, the pandemic, and had many different types of rental assistance, whether it was through the CARES Act or through emergency rental assistance programs. Um, keeping a copy of those rental assistance applications and particularly any notice of receipt or payment that was made can be really helpful in going back and making sure that someone's not also being charged for the amount of rent that maybe rental assistance covered. You can help tenants navigate rental and utility assistance applications. Right now, there is a ton of rental assistance money available. The timelines aren't always that great, um, but being able to show that someone is in the process or has applied for rental assistance is, a, is an important negotiating point with landlords. Um, and particularly if uh, rental assistance would help cure the issue that they're having, helping them navigate those applications can be really important. So making sure that you have uh, follow up on documents needed, answer questions about coverage, eligibility, or how to apply, offer information about contacting the landlord or utility companies about their applications, and providing guidance on proof of application or documentation of the process. 
a lot of times right now, if you uh, are facing an, uh, an eviction or an eviction action for non-payment of rent, one of the most frequent questions someone will ask is, have you applied for rental assistance, whether that's the court or the landlord or um, anyone else? Rental assistance tends to be the biggest um, helper when it comes to um, delaying or, or postponing eviction actions because of non-payment of rent. Okay, keep up to date on changing laws and rules. Um, we currently have no protections in place. No moratorium exists that helps delay or stop eviction actions for non-payment of rent. But if there were, you'd want to know about those changes right away or know that they've ended when they've ended so that folks that were protected, um, you're knowledgeable about those changes as they happen. And know where to find information and where to refer. That's a great way to help. Um, we have an online application for legal help, so you can both contact Community Legal Services directly or any of the other sister organizations that provide free legal help, um, but you can also apply online. So knowing that tenants can go and fill out an online application 24 hours a day um, is, is a great way to help people get in the queue or get started with those processes. We also launched, and what you see here, um, a lot of the information and a lot of the content is come from AZ Eviction Help. It's a website that we started to help people connect with rental assistance programs and with information about evictions. Um, so if you haven't yet checked out AZ Eviction Help, check that out. Um, it's a great resource for tenants um, and helpers alike. We also have a live chat on that site, which can be really helpful to kind of connect with someone and ask right away a question. Um, other resources that can be helpful are azcourthelp.org and arizonatogether.org. So AZ Court Help has forms and information step-by-step -step on how tenants or uh, defendants can respond to eviction action. Um, all that information is available on there. Uh, if you haven't already and you want to, um, it might be interesting or helpful for you to check out what an evictioneering is like. Uh, you can listen in on an eviction calendar, you can check the local court calendars for upcoming hearings, and you can use uh, AZ Court Help to find your, your closest justice court location if that helps. You can help tenants be prepared for court. Um, uh, this talks a little bit about virtual hearings. A lot of tenants are participating remotely, um, whether that's calling into their hearing or video conferencing in. Um, and I've heard a number of complaints from landlord attorneys and from courts about um, making sure that tenants are prepared. So um, calling in 10 minutes before the court calendar is supposed to start and putting your phone on mute is really important apparently, um, that there's a lot of noise and a lot of competition among people who are there for their hearings. Um, it's important to only speak when the judge asks the, the tenant to speak and to be courteous to the judge and the landlord's attorney. If they can call or if you can help them call the clerk before their hearing to make sure they have the right date, time, call in number, um, that can help immensely to make that process a little bit smoother. Let's talk about some of the resources and help that's available. Uh, I talked about legal assistance, but I wanted to show you, and it's linked in this PowerPoint slide here. So when you get the copies of the materials, you'll see that you can uh, click on the link and it'll take you right to the online application. That application determines eligibility for a number of different free and reduced cost programs. So legal aid is free, um, but there are some requirements sometimes, depending on the funding, uh, for help. We also have a reduced cost program called Modest Means for uh, tenants that make more than what um, either the eligibility requirements allow but are still under 250% of federal poverty guidelines, we have a reduced cost program. And all of that's linked through this online application. You can also access the online application using the telephone number there that you see on the screen. It does the same calculation of eligibility and connects people with the resources that are available to them, including community legal services. So let's talk very briefly about rental and utility assistance and where to apply. In normal times, now uh, the emergency rental assistance programs have changed this a little bit, and we're gonna talk about that, but community action agencies are often resources for rent or utility assistance. Same as local cities and towns or the county, and then the state of, of Arizona's Department of Economic Security may have resources that can help. 
let's talk about the emergency rental assistance programs. Um, that has, uh, between all of the different types of legislation or funding that's supported for, for rental assistance, Arizona has received just about a, mil a billion dollars for rental assistance. And not all of that has gone out yet to uh, tenants, but there's a lot of resources that are available. And an eligible household for that rental assistance either qualifies for unemployment or has experienced a reduction in household income, incurred significant costs, or experienced a financial hardship due to COVID-19. They have a risk of experiencing homelessness or housing instability, and has a household income at or below 80% of the area median income. I'm not going to get into too much about all of this, um, except to say that there are rules that uh, prohibit people from having duplications of, of rental assistance or applying in multiple places. And our agencies in Arizona have done a pretty good job of streamlining their application process and, and where someone would go. So if you're curious and have amazing eyesight, you can see there that uh, this is the 80% of area median income levels for each of the areas that are being served. So where someone is located is often an indicator of where they would apply uh, for funding assistance. So for example, all counties besides Yuma, Pima, and Maricopa County are going through DES, Department of Economic Security, for rental assistance and utility assistance. Um, and there's some caveats to this, and I won't get into a whole lot of details, except to say that if you're helping someone in, in those counties or located in those areas, they would start an application with the, with the state, Department of Economic Security. All applications in, in Yuma are going through WACA, uh, Western Arizona Council of Governments. And in Pima County, the city of Tucson and Pima County have teamed up to do their application together. So there's a single application spot in Pima County uh, where someone would apply. In Maricopa County, we have a little bit different. It depends on which city or town. And I'll have to update this a little bit because uh, some of these things have changed between uh, emergency rental assistance one and ERA two. So programs are transitioning into the second pools of, of funds right now. So if someone lives in the city of Phoenix, the Phoenix um, applications are being done by the city. And currently, um, and I believe this is closing through wildfire, um, they have an online application portal. You can submit the application, but it depends on in Maricopa County where you're at, where you would apply. So Mesa is through the city of Mesa, both Chandler and Gilbert's applications are going through um, a community action program. Glendale's is being managed by the city of Glendale and all other cities or towns in Maricopa County would go through the county. So unless somebody lives in those populated areas of Phoenix, Mesa, Chandler, Gilbert, Glendale, um, their applications would go directly, but all others go to the go to Maricopa County. There's also uh, resources available in tribal communities that have received emergency rental assistance funds, and they're located here and on the website. They're linked um, for their location. So if you are looking for rental assistance for someone um, that is perhaps part of a tribal community, that's linked on the website that you can access the application. So one thing that's really important for helpers to know are the types of things that you that the tenant may need in order to participate in applying for that rental assistance. And so uh, we've broken this down a little bit to make it a little bit easier for one document that shows who you are. That can be an identification card or passport, social security card, birth certificate. Um, one thing that shows that it's hard for you to pay your bills or to keep your housing. Um, and that could be uh, a signed statement or a self-attestation is a common way that that's happening right now. Uh, one thing that shows your income for the last two months, even if you aren't working or receiving pay right now, that also can be a, a self-attestation or you can provide any of the proof that's listed here. One thing that shows where you live, so getting a copy of that lease or rental agreement is, again, really important to have, or a utility bill with the name of the person um, who's going to apply, and contact information for the landlord, so the company name, the property manager contact, email, phone, mailing address, those types of things. If you can get that together, um, that alone can make the application for rental assistance go so much faster. So having all this documentation in advance can make that application um, move through the process 
without having to be um, go back and forth to get pieces of information that might be necessary. All right, um, so rental assistance and utility assistance are both available through emergency rental assistance funds um, and it can pay past and future rent. So um, it can go all the way back to March, 2020 and future and in, in, in forward in three month increments, but the max of assistance is 15 months currently. Um, and that's also possible to cover late fees, court costs, attorney's fees related to the judgment. So for example, if somebody has a judgment, maybe they have a judgment against them for the eviction, but they haven't been removed from the property yet. They haven't had that writ of restitution executed yet. Um, then whatever is in that judgment is possible to be shared or covered by the rental assistance, depending on where you're, you're applying. For utility assistance, it's the same thing, can go back to March 2020, but the max assistance is 15 months, and it covers your typical utilities of electricity, gas, water, sewer, trash. Um, and DES in the last uh, several months has taken on utility assistance statewide, regardless of jurisdiction. So if somebody has in say Maricopa County has utilities that are way past you, they, in addition to applying for Maricopa, um, they could alternatively apply for um, the, the same assistance through DES. So um, they can apply to both places, but they can apply to DES will also cover other areas um, regardless of the jurisdiction. On our website, we have um, on the AZ Eviction Help website, we have all the utility and gas company contact information and the types of programming that they're offering directly to people outside of emergency rental assistance. They have some programs that they're um, that they're helping with. And then there's additional funds that traditionally help low-income households with utility assistance, and that's through community action programs. And those are also listed on the website um, by location. We also have on the website some information about shelter. Um, if someone, <clears throat> the eviction has happened, um, they've been removed from the property, what types of resources may be available for them, or for their pets. We've got different information on the website um, and how to prepare and expect what to expect after an eviction or a lockout has happened. So I'll just say that that's uh, what we have to cover for today. We went through it a little bit fast, but we wanted to leave some time for questions. Um, and so TJ, I'll turn it over to you for any questions that might've been shared. Um, we did have one question related to rental assistance. Um, uh, somebody asked, where does someone submit rental assistance requests in Tempe? In Tempe, they'd go through Maricopa County. All right, thank you. And that's the only question that we received thus far. Um, we'll give a couple of minutes. So uh, anybody, if you have any questions, uh, uh, final questions or things that you would like to get answered of any of the content today, um, feel free to use the Q&A section. Um, we'll give it just a few minutes here for that. And then um, with no other questions, we uh, will uh, close it out. Um, so with that, yeah, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to post them now. Um, and we'll just give about two minutes here until 945. And if there are no questions until then, we'll close it out. I think one thing that we get a, a lot of questions about or there have been a lot of concerns is that people, uh, tenants have applied for rental assistance. They've submitted their application. They've submitted all of the information that's required and then they don't hear anything. We hear that a lot. Um, and it's because the volume, there's uh, a lot of people that are working really hard behind the scenes to process all of these applications. And in doing so, their timeline has been, um, sometimes it's up to a month before someone will even hear something after submitting an application. And that can be really frustrating for the uh, tenant who's trying to communicate to the landlord that they've applied for rental assistance and haven't heard anything yet. Um, but having that documentation and some of the some of the programs have, and I think Maricopa County has a uh, portal where you can go and log in and check the status of your application and see what's happened. And sometimes screenshots of that application can be really helpful to just 
keep that communication going with the landlord and saying, yes, I still have applied, but you can see here's screenshot today hasn't changed. Um, so that's something that comes up kind of frequently with, um, with rental assistance, but patience and, and frequent communication with the landlord is key. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we have another question. It, um, who reports an eviction judgment to the credit bureau? Is it the courts? Is it the landlord? Is it someone else? Um, the, there are a lot of the landlords, there are agencies that do that for the landlord attorneys. Um, that's, there are certain agencies that are doing that who are um, making that report from the judgments and they do that so that other landlords when they want to rent can tell whether there's been a judgment or not. Um, and so not every landlord attorney does that but the big ones do hire someone to do that for them. Okay, so it would be done on the side though of the landlord, whether yeah. it's somebody that they work with or themselves versus That's, the court actually doing that. We, we actually do a lot of consumer work too on this. And so if there's, we really try to help tenants try to clear up their credit, uh, well, all individuals clear up their credit. And so one thing they can do is, you know, negotiate, we can do is negotiate with the landlord to get that removed off their record. And then tenants can follow up because there are, Fair debt collection practices the landlord has to do, and um, and fair uh, debt uh, reporting practices, and so uh, that is something that CLS does. It helps tenants if if there's been a problem with how it's been reported or reported incorrectly. Great, thank you, Pam. Um, all right, uh, with that, that is all the questions. So a big shout out. Oh, we got one more, but um, I will uh, shout out to Pam and Chris for helping out here. Um, we have one question here as well that says, can a judgment be sold to debt collectors to begin garnishments? Yes. Just like any uh, other yes. judgment can be. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Pam. All right. And uh, for all the attendees, um, I'll just reiterate this content, including the recording, the presentation, and the documents that were referenced by both Pam and Chris will be posted to MAG's website. Um, I will shoot out an email blast to um, to everybody indicating when that will happen. It should be within uh, the next week. Um, and then feel free, you have Pam and Chris's contact information here if you have any follow-up questions um, about the content on here. But again, a huge shout out um, to, to Pam and Chris for taking the time. This is such great information. Um, and uh, with that, we will close it out. So thanks everybody for your time this morning. Hope you have a good rest of your Tuesday. Thank you.